Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and uh, I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. This week, introducing V-Ray 3.0 for Rhino. Join Austin Peppel as he walks you through the new and easy to use interface of V-Ray 3.0 for Rhino. What a treat. Today's presenter, Austin, joined Chaos, Chaos Group in 2015 in uh, the Baltimore office as a 3D artist and uh, Austin has a BA in environmental design and has extensive experience with digital fabrication, robotics and visualization. Austin strives to integrate creation and prototyping with 3D visualization and overall better design workflow. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is one of the largest online store for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our webpage at novage.com. And for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus and Twitter. Coming up next week, Rapid 3D Fabrication with Vectorworks Subdivision Modeling. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded live. So if you want to rewatch this or any webinar episodes in our collection, just send a ad head on over to Novage's YouTube and Vimeo channel. Now, without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass the screen to Austin so he can really show you what V-Ray 3.0 for Rhino is all about. Take it away, Austin. Awesome. So, uh, you guys can see my screen or my screen showing? Yes. Okay. So, Today we have Fernando here as well. He is the BLM for V-Ray, for Rhino, and Mikhail Jagan, who is the 3D team lead. And I'm going to go through very quickly a general overview of the UI, go into a few more specifics of the new features, and then hopefully have enough time for you guys to ask questions and we can delve into something more specific that you guys want to talk about. So when you first open up V-Ray 3.0, this is going to be the new thing, uh, the new UI that you actually see. A lot different from the past, especially with 2.0. And you get a preview in the center. Everything can be moved around and adjusted. Uh, everything separated into these four panels, which I'll go into with a little more detail in a second. There's going to be a library for multiple types of materials, so car paint, glass, uh, plastic, porcelain. You can go over to your library, start searching for stuff. Say, I want a blue plastic. It'll take both of those words, try and uh, find something. I can drag and drop into my material list. That will automatically start previewing in real time. So no longer do you have to render back and forth just to see what your material looks like. It's all right here. Uh, each material has a sort of quick settings, which we'll go over in a, in a different uh, scene. We have a light lister, so every light in your scene can be listed here, and anytime you click a light, it'll be selected, all with its own settings, the main ones, of course, being shown here, um, and then more detailed ones in other, other panels. We have a geometry list, so any sort of extra uh, object properties when it comes to the clipper planes, the grass, which we have, proxies and infinite planes will be shown here, and I'll go over that more in another file as well. And then probably the biggest surprise for 3.0 is the, the settings. If you want to control your render quality, it's now one slider. If you want to tr uh, control your exposure, it's also just one slider. So if I come in here and start a render, you'll see that this is a little bit dark. I can stop. I can adjust my exposure, start again, and it's adjusting on the fly. Maybe I want to start this with RT so I can get a little bit more of a quicker response. And if you notice how fast everything is going, uh, 3.0 is built on a on a faster framework altogether. So updates in RT, updates in quality settings, all of that is a lot faster than it was in the past. And it's also using variance-based adaptive sampling. What that, what that means is 
you don't have to go into your materials, you don't have to go into your advanced settings and try and figure out what your subdivs have to be for each and every particular parameter anymore. All that's done dynamically in the background. We also have dynamic bucket splitting. So I don't know if that was uh, seen. And we also have progressive rendering. Now, progressive rendering lets you see uh, effects that are usually seen in post during the render. So you don't have to wait for your first pass in your radiance mapping or anything like that before you actually start seeing something. And the frame buffer itself has had a lot of improvements. Um, say you wanted to take this into Photoshop, which is a lot of people's workflow, especially in design. Uh, you don't have to go there and do everything anymore. If you want to adjust exposure, we have a slider for that, and it's based on the, the Reinhardt color correction. So I can adjust my exposure. I can take my highlight burn down. I can increase my contrast. All of that right here. If I want to undock and put this to the side while I'm working, start messing with white balance, hue or saturation, all of it's working, and all of that will be added to your image when you save it out. Also, all of this is running with uh, Embry, which is a type of uh, kernel optimization for rendering. So in the past, using brute force, brute force might not have been an option for a lot of people. Uh, now with Embry, that's, that's working a lot better. Okay. So now I'm going to go into another scene and start talking about the materials in a little bit more depth. If it all... Uh, as long as it opens, of course, there it goes. So RT has seen a lot of improvements, uh, especially in the past where you might have to click in your scene just to move around. You no longer have to do that. Just holding shift, I can click and start panning and moving around, rotating within the frame buffer itself. I can hit control and pan, and I can, of course, hold shift and use the scroll wheel to scroll in and out without needing to go back and forth from here to the viewport and, and so on. So this allows for quicker material creation. And one of the things that you're seeing here is a true subsurface scattering material. In the past, say if you wanted to make a plastic cap, this is what you would get. You want it to be green, this is, this is it. Maybe you can do some stuff with um, Photoshop. Maybe you could use the frame buffer to adjust some settings and try and do some look development, but this is what you're going to get. You don't get as much with um, actual light penetration and translucency other than with a, a faked effect. But what subsurface scattering gives you is true penetrative depth to light and how light is working. And say I'm looking at this, I want my RT to focus on something more specific like this area. Render region will work with it. In real time. So now I want to start looking at this piece. All of that works with render region and is, as you can see, very, very fast. We also have another material and that, uh, that is new to Rhino 3.0 and that is the car paint material. So usually in the past, if you wanted to make a car paint, it's a multi-layer process. This is 
more optimized for speed improvements. And you can quite quickly come in and using quick settings without needing to go into the more advanced settings, which we still have, you can start coming in and changing, say, color. Bam, green. And RT is running in both the, the preview window as well as, as the larger RT window. So if I want to, for whatever reason, change the coat color, I can. Maybe I want it to be uh, this purple plum color. It'll immediately change, and you can see the effects within RT. No problem. Also within here, we have the ability to drag and drop, which right now it's not uh, updating the actual colors. It's updating it in RT, but not within the UI. That's a, a bug we're taking care of. But we can also copy. And also we have a lot of new materials when it comes to maps. So of course you can do your bitmaps, you can do color correction. Color correction is a lot easier to use now than it was in 2.0. And we have things like edges. So when it comes to round corners, you can put that in your bump. If you just want to highlight your edges, that'll show up here as well. And we have curvature map, dirt maps, cloth, checkers, cellular. And noise maps, and of course we have everything that's legacy to 2.0. So anything that you've brought in from a 2.0 scene will be adapted to 3.0. Uh, it's weird doing this without anybody uh, asking me any questions. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to quickly go over to what I think, uh, for me, I, I really enjoy this feature. It's my favorite, and that is going over probabilistic lighting. So I will open up a scene for that specifically. Now, probabilistic lighting is on by default. And what it does is take a, it takes a certain amount of your lights and replicates its sampling across the rest of the lights. So it increases render time. I mean, it decreases render time significantly. It will be on by default. Um, it's all the way in the advanced settings, but again, for the most part, you'll never need to come over here. So right now, probabilistic lighting is off. Um, what I like to do is set a timer and render. Now, since we don't have too terribly much time, I'll render for just 35 seconds. Oops. Approximately. So right now it's doing the light cache. And it's going and going. Still hasn't started the render yet. It's now just starting the render. And this has maybe 250 lights in here. And I'll stop. So about 35 seconds. Now I can go into history, set a path for this, pictures, save this out, and now let's turn probabilistic lighting on, and you're immediately going to see a difference. Set this to 8. So render, and it's already starting the render. So I accidentally started the timer a little late, so I'll only go to, say, 30. 
Now in the past, especially with architectural scenes where you're maybe bringing in hundreds of lights or you have multiple buildings and you don't have time to go in and optimize every single light for every single building you have, or if you're doing a product and you're trying to make LEDs, um, this is a problem. And here's the difference. Same amount of time rendering, about. But with probabilistic lighting off, this might have taken another five to 10 minutes just to get to this point. And this feature is going to be on by default. You don't have to go in and mess with it. But it, it makes a world of difference. And it's just one of the other uh, advancements we've made with 3.0 when it comes to making renderings faster, making scenes look better without as much effort Okay, so now I'm going to go over a few of the, the, the objects that we have now, um, aside from infinite planes and proxies, but really the, the fur and the clipper objects that we have. Ah, as well as our HOSEC sky. So if I just kick off a render here, off the bat, the sky is, uh, is called the HOSEC sky. It's a new way of calculating GI with light, especially the actual sunlight that you can put within Rhino. It's a more physically accurate way of doing it, and it works with aerial perspective, which is something that will be a future release as well. So the, clip plane, the clipper plane is really easy to get started and start working with. If you go over to your object tab, um, all you have to do is click it. It'll show up. You can move it around, flip it. Say I want to see this from the front view. And this is all inside of your dashboard as well. So my clipping plane will populate my geometry list and all the settings for that will be right here. So if I zoom in and do a render, you'll notice that the geometry is cut. So no longer do you have to go in and specifically cut geometry so you can do sections or show cutaways of, uh, of products you can just set this. And not only can you cut through and have this open geometry, you can go into your geometry panel and say, hey, I want it to use the object's material. So when it does a cut, I want you to fill that with the same material that's being cut through. And it'll fill it in. Or say, you want it to be a poche pattern or you want it to just look different or be set apart. Well, instead of using the object material, you can specify a, a specific material. I have a grass material for the grass I'm going to show later. Um, so I can use that. Stop this render, render again. And you'll see now that everything that's been cut by this plane, uh, by the clipper plane, is now a different material. And there's, of course, the include, exclude, so whatever you want this to cut will be what's being cut. And now I will go over fur, which we usually use for grass, but for products it could be whatever you want it to be. Whatever you have that has some sort of uh, aspect of cloth or string or something like that. So if I show. All I have is a plane and this plane has a really basic texture on it. It's just, if I go into my quick, quick settings, 
basic reflection and a diffuse color that has a grass image. And that's it. Uh, I mess with the glossiness some, but that's all I needed to do. Now, when I go into the object panel and hit add V-Ray Fur, it'll populate your scene with a little gizmo that you can control all of your firm, uh, your fur parameters with. So if I come over here, now anything I do to this object, whether it's place a material on it like a grass or if I um, want to do mapping, this is just a physical representation of what's actually going on. So I can come over here and change length, gravity, um, how much is it bending, how much does it taper, what's the scale for this compared to the scene for all of your grass, and quite quickly, if I start an RT render, you can get something that looks pretty good for grass. Now, if I zoom out, Say I just want to look at this area. These are all individual pieces of geometry. Um, it's rendering thousands upon thousands right now. And as you can see, it's, it's really quick. This is also using the Embry and is optimized for things like this. So instead of going to Photoshop to add grass or using a texture with a displacement, which is always hard to make look very good, you can just add a simple material, tell it to be a fur object, and start getting something that looks really good really quickly. And so this is nice, but what else can it do, right? Well, in your parameters, you can say, well, how much do I want it to vary? What's my thickness? Uh, all of this, there's a level of detail optimization. So the farther the grass is away from your camera, uh, the less of it, it there is and the bigger it is. So it sort of fades out and the geometry that it actually has. But what I like the most about it is this um, textures option. So say you're doing something with landscape or you have a pattern for a coat or anything like that you can convert that over to a black and white texture. So I'll make this uh, a checker so we can see this easily. If I start off another RT, takes a little time to compile all the geometry, but once it's there, now you can see that that pattern has populated the actual grass So you can imagine if you're doing landscape design or something like that, and every single one of these pieces of fur geometry are just grabbing the color of the pixel of where it's being spawned from and, uh, and taking that property and rendering with it. Then of course the, the clipper plane still in the back being uh, cutting the building. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to go over before there's any questions and I can do a few few demos is what we're doing for VR and I'll open a scene for that as well. Now we don't have it in this current build, but it is something that we will have soon. And it's a one button solution for, for exporting VR scenes. Well, for exporting scenes for VR. Um, stereoscopic with the, the correct proportions and all of that. Right now, um, especially in 2.0, if this is what you wanted, you would have to go in and go to your advanced settings and start messing with aspect ratios and finding checkboxes and checking things. Uh, we won't have that anymore. It's just one button. And 
this is uh, what you're going to get out of it. So say I want to go to the kitchen, one button, render, and as you can tell, this is uh, six renderings at one time. It's the front, back, top, bottom as a cube map. And very quickly, this is going to be rendering through. Now, for VR, there's recommended sizes, but with our solution, if you want to do some tests, you can do tests and then come in and do a final render. And then when you want to see it overlaid on top of each other, you can, of course, do the stereo and see what that looks like. Okay, so I went through that super fast. I would like to see if there are any questions or things that people would like to see or demo. Yes, Austin. Um, one question. I know that the, your team, the Chaos Group team, has done a great job in answering all the questions uh, throughout the webinar, but um, what are the hardware specifications of your machine? I have a GTX 1080. Okay. And how does that VR cube image get into a player viewer? Well, that all depends on what you're getting it into. So Google Cardboard and its specific viewers work fine with it, but there's things like um, uh, Iris VR, which has an app that takes cube maps. And that will go onto your phone, that will go onto an Oculus, that will go onto the Gear VR. Um, any sort of VR viewer, we have the support for. Whether it's a spherical map, or a cube map, we have those options. Um, by default, we'll export the cube map, though, and most most um, companies support that with their VR. Great. And um, for instance, somebody is asking, how can I be a part of the Array 3 tester? Okay, yeah, so we're having open beta within a month, or in about a month, and We'll have a link where you can go in and sign up, get the download, and start messing with it. And give us some feedback so we can make things better, change some stuff around um, before doing a final release. Cool. This is great recruiting. And how is the speed of VRA uh, 3.0 on Rhino uh, as opposed to 3ds Max? It should be the same. So the only difference between something like Max and Rhino is that Rhino is using NURBS, right, not a mesh. So we have to transfer everything into mesh um, when we're rendering. But would you actually see the preview? So what's actually shown in this viewport right now is a mesh, and you can change that within, um, within Rhino itself. So there's a, there's a little bit of time, maybe like a, a millisecond, where it's processing for that, but it's, it's not any different. All right. Can you drag and drop textures directly from folders and not to search for every texture differently? Um, what do you mean, like from your desktop onto your into your library, perhaps? Um, perhaps. No, not yet. That is something that we are looking into, though. Drag and drop, generally, we want more of it. So right now, you'd have to have this actually set up in your in a library or a folder structure so you could drag and drop to that folder structure and it would populate here in your categories that you can then look through in your library um, but we don't have anything right now where you can say drag from your desktop onto here okay so do you have is there a place where um, our uh, prospect uh, tester can find the link uh, to join the the beta testing? Is there um, like a, a specific link where oh. they can go and, and contact you? Uh, 
I think that's a. Uh, I think Fernando would know about that a little more. Um, sorry, I was caught with something. Fernando, is there a link that people can go to to get onto the open beta or have uh, more information about this? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Um, we are going to have a, a beta application form in our website as soon as we are ready to release the the public beta. We are going to send emails and new letters, so everybody's going to know know when we're going to start. As soon as we start, we're going to have in our web page an application form, and the only thing that the user have to do is just fill the application form, and automatically it's going to be. Um, to be a better tester. Great, great. Is it another question? Is it possible to export cameras from the Ray Rhino to SketchUp or 3ds Max? So we're gonna VR scene support is a lot better with 3.0 between both uh, CAD programs and design programs, as well as uh, more animation prone programs like 3ds Max. Um, Basically, they're all speaking the same language now. So if you want to import a material into SketchUp, um, all you have to do is say, hey, I want to um, oops, save or open. That's open. <laughs> I want to save. You save it out as a VR mat. SketchUp will open this. 3ds Max will open this. Um, if you want, you can export an actual VR scene. The VR scene will take everything in here with your camera positions and everything and stick it into whatever program that has V-Ray. Okay. Is V-Ray cooking its own meshes or using Rhino's preview mesh? It's using Rhino's preview mesh. Um, it does a little bit of optimization to it in cleanup, but from that point, that's, that's all it's using. So if you wanted to change your preview mesh from uh, jagged and rough to smoother and slower, I think is what it says, um, or to whatever custom settings and presets it has, um, that will affect what your render looks like. And can the material preview be altered or resized? Yeah. So if I want it to be smaller or bigger, um, just however much space you want to take it up, yeah. Cool. Are V-Ray materials from Macs and other apps now compatible with V-Ray for Rhino? To a point. So Rhino, SketchUp, all of them right now will go into any other program. Uh, there's some things we just don't have right now. So if you made a specific fall-off mat within, um, within 3ds Max, per se, and it's a specific map, we might not have that specific map here, but we'll have something close. Um, so that VR mat will come over with everything but the specific things that we just don't have yet. Um, but we're in the process of making all of those as we speak. So if I go over to quick settings, um, say if they have a different type of fall off, um, it would be replaced with this sort of fall off, but it won't be maybe one to one with theirs until we have something that's that specific for them. But say they have a checker, we have the checker, it works fine, it's one to one. They have cellular, we have cellular, it works fine one to one. But there are some that won't yet. And uh, the, in the, this is just of a few questions that um, are bringing up the same issue. Will the new version of V-Ray be fully compatible with the previous one in terms of material lighting and parameters set up so that previous project can be open and reworked? Yes and no. So 2.0 does things a little bit differently when it comes to, um, let's say, uh, with, with all sub-div applications. So your lights will transfer over correctly. The lights will have the same lighting, but some parameters won't be the same when it comes to, say, sub-divs. So that might mean you have to come over here um, and just mess with your quality settings, um, which would just be this slider. When it comes to things like um, say, again, when it comes to fall-offs and maps and stuff, we are doing those differently because we want it to be more compatible with all the other versions of V-Ray and things like Max and Maya, but we still have um, legacy. So fall-off legacy is how it actually works within 2.0, and so does Fresnel legacy. 
um, noise legacy, that's what those are. But just regular noise is the noise that are used between Maya Max, SketchUp, and Rhino. And that's why we have the two. So we can use both. But it should support most things from 2.0, um, from proxies up to, to maps. OK, good to know. Has the material library been expanded in 3.0? So we are in discussions uh, about that. I'm actually part of the, the small team going in to make a new material library. Um, but I don't know how much more I can say about that. The, the answer would be maybe or yes, but I can't, I can't say too much about that. <laughs> Okay, we, we yes, <laughs> we understand. <laughs> Can you rotate the dome light HDRI directly and not inside from the material editor? Yes, so there is a parameter. Um, let's see if I can just make one real quick. Uh, so right now when you make a dome light, it'll ask you for an image. I'm just going to grab something there's not even an image. Uh, oh, it'll force you to do an EXR HDR. Um, I don't have one at the moment, so I can just hit cancel. And there is a parameter called lock dome light, and that locks the orientation of your actual HDRI, HDRI or EXR to the orientation of your dome light. So as I rotate this, that's what's going to show up um, here. So whatever image I have will rotate with this, as long as it was positioned and mapped correctly to begin with. OK. Will there, will there be in the future a node-based material editor similar to 3ds Max? <laughs> I would like to hope so, but <laughs> that, I think that would be more of my personal opinion. I think that's where things might be heading, but I can't say uh, too much about that either. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this is like turning to high espionage to find out secrets <laughs> from Virai. Good, I like it. Okay, any changes to the network rendering with Virai 3.0? Ah, uh, yes. I wish I had DR set up, but our DR is being used, uh, our machines are being used elsewhere right now. Um, DR is a lot better than it was in the past. I, I can say that. It's faster, it's faster for parsing things and bringing things over. Um, V-Ray in general is faster in 3.0 than it was in 2.0, but DR, a lot of the problems and bugs that we had in the past are solved. Um, and it uses just uh, uh, the same sort of node license. You bring it over and that's, that's it, so. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so um, Dave Schultz is asking you to render the kitchen because he really wants to see how it looks. Can you do that? <laughs> yeah. Will it take? Okay. Do we have enough? Yeah, of course. And, so it's uh, already starting to render, but it yeah. can. Uh, I can just let it go. Oh, oops. I actually have to be in the kitchen to render the kitchen. So I can let this go for a bit while um, I answer any other questions. Yeah, the, the million dollar questions. Uh, <laughs> when, when you know, when uh, V-Ray 3.0 for Rhino will be out for purchase. And uh, we care about you, so, you know, don't say anything that would cost your life. But ballpark. <laughs> uh, I, uh, just you guys be, be faithful. It's gonna come out, and you'll find it, out from the badge first. That's all yeah, I can it, say. It'll, yeah, it'll come out. It's just we want to make sure we make the best product for people to use, and especially with this overhaul when it comes to a new UI, a new whole workflow of how to actually create that's hopefully easier and better. We want to take the time to make sure that it's usable and that when um, hopefully you guys who are doing the open beta go in and use it and have things to either say worked well or didn't work well at all, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. We don't know how long it might take to go through all of that and make our product better. So how long will it be? I don't know. Um, depends on how much people actually uh, 
like it the way it is right now and how much we want to change and make better from it before we release. Cool. Um, uh, another request from Dave Schultz. Um, is it possible to see the kitchen? <laughs> I know he's an acquaintance. <laughs> so is it possible to render the kitchen normally and not VR in the VR cube? Oh, yeah. So, oh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't have any uh, materials applied or anything. But, so right now I'm going to be setting this back to what it would be like uh, normally, but this in the past would be where you would have to go to start messing with um, all your settings to figure out what you need it to be. Um, but I'll, I'll take this down some. Uh, uh, what's a good one? Uh, 600 to half. So yeah, this is uh, the the normal rendering. All right. <laughs> well, it looks good already. Um, so um, will VRA 3.0 have triplanar mapping in Rhino and Material Blend, as in 3ds Max? So we will have blend materials. That is something we are working on. Um, though. Right now we also still, I, I forgot to mention this, um, the same layering system in 2.0 we have here. So say I have this uh, Coke BRDF that I messed with already and wanted to add another layer, I can come in here and do that. Um, can't do that within the quick setting, so if I wanted to make a generic material, can't do that. but. I can add and layer everything here. Now the blend material of course is different because you can have specific uh, bump maps, normal maps and all that with it and that's why we're, we're looking into that. Um, I forgot what the other one was. <laughs> it was, uh, let's see, um, a material oh, tri blend. mapping. Uh, yeah, triplanar yeah. mapping. Uh, <laughs> So we are dividing uh, the beta in two stages. So we're gonna have a, uh, we're gonna start beta uh, one pretty close, and then we're gonna have a second stage of beta. Uh, we hope we are working hard to have triplar mapping and blend material on the second beta stage. Not in this one, but it's gonna be on the second one. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, there was another question. Um, Will be there any multi-texture materials in order to make flooring and tiling, etc.? Uh, by multi-texture, what do <laughs> what do you yeah. mean? Uh, separate from, say, the blend material and the layering system, like uh, composite maps, or. Um. or because if you mean, if, if uh, that person means by composite maps, that is also something we're looking into. Um, not only for that, but also for rounded edges so that we can, or that the user can uh, have rounded edges as well as uh, multiply on top, maybe uh, some sort of bump to give it uh, a textured look. Um, but that would also yes. work with things like, like floor. So you would have your wood and then uh, multiply, say, a grid on top of it and get your indents and stuff like that. So if, if that's if that's the case, then yes, we, we are looking towards that. I think that's what he meant. And um, somebody's asking if uh, it will be ready, the new version, uh, will also work with Rhino plugins like uh, HDR Lite or Bongo. Yeah, so it's going to work with Bongo. It'll be working with HDR Lite Studio. Um, yeah, uh, you name it, we're, we're supporting it. I mean, of course, we can't go out and look at every single plugin there is, but a lot of the ones that are used often uh, we'll, we'll have support for, especially when it comes to Bongo and HDR Lite Studio. Okay. 
So many questions, so little time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's good. You know what I was thinking also? I was thinking we could, I could send you all the questions, uh, even the ones that the team replied to, you know, um, to each single individual, and maybe yeah. we could write, uh, write them down on a blog post and uh, so everybody could see what everybody else asked and it'd be very informative. So if we can get to read them all, um, just look for them on the Novage blog and we'll, we'll do a little Q&A with written answers and maybe give some information on the, on the beta testing so everybody's happy. What do you think? Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Um, however okay. many questions you can yeah. fit on there, I'll, okay. I'll go through. Okay, so uh, this is in reference to setting up 10 bitmap, 10 bitmap textures applying to a single material and having Rhino V-Ray select random objects to apply a single bitmap oh. to them. That is, we have support for it with the VR scenes but we will be looking into that as well. Okay. Everything that um, is a V-Ray specific parameter or texture within say Max or Maya, we will be implementing. Whether it's within the first release, I can't say, but it will be in there, whether it's uh, 3.0 or 3.1. But yeah, it, we're looking into that as well. And what about color gemstone materials? Does V-Ray have these, uh, or color golds, or rose golds, green, I guess, um, for jewelry design? For, yeah. Oh, for, um, for material presets? Yeah. Yeah, we have some. Um, that would be from the, the older library, which is going to be updated. But we are also looking at um, different ways to create those in the future as presets for people to have. Okay, and what's uh, the best method to reduce noise? Well, now it's uh, it's just this, the one slider. Um, what this is doing is changing a lot of settings that we've, uh, we've set in the background. So um, for those who are a little more advanced or, or know what they're talking about or doing. So as I change this, um, right now it's the noise threshold and the minimum shading rate that's changing. And that's what's going to be used to actually uh, clean up your renders more. Also we're going to be looking into the denoiser. So that means you can render for shorter amounts of time and then just apply the denoiser as the, as, as the, the filter and get rid of noise that way. Okay. And um, let's see, the, I'm not sure if this was answered earlier, but, um, okay, let's see. Are we still going to have 10 nodes in distributed rendering included for Rhino? Uh, that sounds like a Fernando question. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet. This is a cell question. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, the BLM question, the cell questions. However, the cool thing is that we are going to use a universal render node. So the render node, the new render node, could be used on Rhino, Capture, 3D Max, Maya, Softimage, a standalone. So we are going to use one render node for every single V-Ray platform. Yeah. Okay. I think I have another questions about material. In 3D. Yeah. In 3ds Max, there are settings to randomize materials with a limited number of bitmaps, such as wood floor tiles. Can you do something similar um, since you do not have a material node editor? If we had what, um, right now we don't have that sort of, uh, we don't have that material map here right now. That's, we're looking towards that in the future. Uh, that's similar to, to the other one. Right right now, if you want to randomize, there's, uh, I can think of ways to do it with Grasshopper, with material IDs, but that's starting to get a little advanced. Uh, I, I would actually like to get into that more um, if that question's uh, saved somewhere or if I can get that email. That would be cool to, to talk to them about. 
Sure. Yeah, no problem. And uh, any improvements to material mapping? Yeah, so everything, um, so <laughs> in the past with 2.0, there are some times where you'd go to a rendered view, you see your image in one direction, um, you go to render and it's flipped. Uh, that's not a problem anymore. Um, when it comes to just getting a bitmap, I'll just get this grass. Uh, this is still being worked on and is in development, but we have all the normal uh, stuff you would be expecting. So if you want to just place your picture and move it around, you want the whole picture, you want to crop it, um, if you want to add some UV noise, that'll be there. Um, and then we have, of course, our UVW, so just the normal channel and the environment. So you'd probably usually be new using the normal channel and any repeating for the UNV can be done here, as well as done in, <laughs> as well as done in uh, Rhino. So if you have a surface mapping, uh, you can also copy and paste all of these to, to wherever, so, okay. which is <laughs> a huge deal. So if you're sitting here and you add this, which for, whatever reason right now it's uh, not updating in the quick settings, I can just drag and drop or copy, close this, make a completely new material. Ah, well, found a small bug. <laughs> and say I want it to be a plastic, but I want that plastic to then have that grass. Well, I can still paste it from within a different material. Um, entirely. It saves it. So that, I know that was a big deal for a lot of users and, and me too when I'm trying to make a material and take things over. Um, all that's uh, solved now. Cool. Jason would love to hear about assigning material IDs in Grasshopper as you just mentioned. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, that'll be another time but maybe we can have a, a meeting specific for that. Cool. Okay, I think uh, um, I think that's it. That's it. The more questions are coming in asking when when can we get it? When can we get it? But <laughs> I told you, Chaos Group is gonna kill me if I say anything. So. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's it's it's, it's gonna happen. Be faith, be faithful. And um, oh, one more question just popped in. Can you see the dome light environment in the viewport for placement? Ah, uh, so say in your rendered view, I, I don't believe we can right now, but that is definitely something that uh, we want to look into, and this is why we have uh, open beta, because we want to get this input in, so. Cool. All right, great. Anything else you want to show off before we say goodbye? <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm done, so. Okay. Okay, great. That was really instructive. So as I said, I'll try to put together all the questions, send them to you guys, and then maybe you can, uh, you know, well, um, write a, a list of answers so everybody can have all the information in one place. And I'm going to take back the screen for now. Sorry to give you just a glimpse of um, B-Ray 3.0 um, for <laughs> Rhino. Uh, just hang on and gone to your horses. It will be out soonish, let's say. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for attending and thanks to the Chaos Group team for the support throughout the webinar. And uh, I want to remind everyone to visit our page at noveg.com where you can find VRA 2.0 for now. But as soon as the version 3 is out, we'll be the first to have it. And um, for information on the latest specials and new releases, join the Novag Network on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. And don't forget the next week's webinar is about rapid 3D fabrication with Vectorworks sub subdivision modeling. And to rewatch today's webinar or previous ones, check out our Novag YouTube and Vimeo channels. Our webinar playlist as webinar for every software taste. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>